Well, welcome, brothers and sisters, again in Christ. It's a joy to be with you, to share the word. And as Robert said, to feast around the table of the Lord as we engage ourselves in the study of his word. His word is, is the bread of life. And it's important that we understand that word, we feed on that word, and our bodies are nourished by that word. And while we would be dealing with, you know, concepts which would appear to be heavy theological, I want us to understand that there's meaning, there's purpose, and there is God's perspective and position on issues which are important to our Christian lives, not just from a theological perspective, but very important to how, how we live our lives in relation to God's promises, God's purpose, and God's plan for us as people and for this world, for the universe. And he wants us to be on the side which would bring us positive results. In other words, not to follow the world system, take the mark of the beast and be controlled by the unholy trinity, the false prophet, the beast, and dragon, the serpent, Satan himself, who inspires all the forces of darkness that oppress the church and seek to, to destroy the kingdom of God. But God would rather want us to take his seal, his mark, which is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, causing us to live according to his purpose and his plan and his design for our lives. I recognize that whatever opposition comes against us from the enemy, that we are on the winning side with Jesus. And though our heart may be the fray, as our song says, my soul can boldly say, I am on the winning side. That is the, the overall encouragement that Revelation is giving to us. To get all the theological concepts and all the terms that we try to understand and to define, there is an overarching message of hope and confidence that the church will face battles and trials and conflict and war spiritually, not, not necessarily literally, even though there have been literal battles that the church had to fight. There is a greater spiritual battle which we are all engaged in. And this is war waged by the devil. So war is not always literal. There is a spiritual application to conflict that we will experience as Christians. And we know for sure that Satan is behind it all. But God wants us to be on that side, which assures us of victory. And we not fear the destruction of our body but we fear rather the destruction of our soul and spirit in hell. So even though physical war could take our lives and we could be martyred for the sake of the gospel, we have the assurance that we will live eternally with Christ. And though our bodies can be harmed, our spirit can remain well intact and focus on God and his plan of perspective for our lives. So we want that to be something that we grasp and amidst all that we have been discussing and trying to understand, that we, we get that much and that God is going to bring judgment on all those forces that oppose his purpose and his plan. And we do not want to be on the side that incurs God's wrath, but God's mercy and God's blessing. So we hope that as, as we engage or we have engaged in these studies, that we are cognizant of that fact, that it's all about a relationship with God and where we spend eternity depends on that relationship and how we live our lives according to the plan and purpose of God and not focus on literally taking a mark or not taking a mark but focusing on not being controlled by the systems of this world by the prince of the power of the air the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience the person who controls the world systems and all the negative things that impact on our lives spiritually, Satan is behind all of these things. And we have to make sure that we are covered by the blood of Christ. Because that's how the saints overcame according to Revelation by the word of the testimony of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. And that's what we have to overcome by as well. So the message of John, yes, was addressed to the first century church, but there are spiritual applications there for 
for Christians through all the ages, right to eternity. And once we apply this to our lives, we know that we will come up victorious because Christ is fighting for us. Once we remain in his army, in his holy army that we've enlisted in, we are going to come out more than conquerors. And that's the assurance, that the, that's the hope that revelation is given to us. So with all the drama that unfolds, all the narrative, all the visions, all the apocalyptic literature, all the symbolism, all of that is encapsulated in the fact that the church is going to be opposed and oppressed, but we are going to come up victorious because God is fighting for us. And any forces that seek to attack God's people are forces that are fighting against God. So the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. And remember, that's what God assured the Apostle Paul of in his attacks against the church. God said, Paul, you are fighting against me. So when forces are fighting to, against God's people, they're fighting against God and God will come to our defense because we are his people. Last week, I hope that we would have fully understood the concept of the millennium and the kingdom of God because that's what we were engaged in. And just for a, a brief recap, we identify the fact that the concept of the millennium, the thousand year reign, is only mentioned in the book of Revelation in the 20th chapter. So there are no other direct references to a thousand year reign in the Old Testament or the New Testament. But those who support the literal concept of, of a physical reign of Christ in Jerusalem on the throne of David, reigning over the resurrected saints from the rapture, as they would have indicated, and those who would have died and resurrected after the tribulation, they go in to a physical, literal thousand year reign with Christ. And so they view a lot of the scripture references that we looked at in the book of Isaiah, especially because a lot of the references to the kingdom of God were in Isaiah, but there are other parts of the Old Testament which really speak about the kingdom of God. So yes, we accept the fact that those scriptures spoke about the kingdom, but we believe that they were speaking about the kingdom which was established at Christ's first advent and not a kingdom that was set up after he returns and reigns on the earth for a thousand years. So we have agreed that the concept of the thousand year reign is a real concept. So we're not throwing out the idea and dismissing it as being amillennialist, meaning that there's no thousand year period spoken of in, in Revelation. There is but it's the application of it, it's what it means, it's the interpretation of it. So we see the, the thousand year reign as a literal exact number, but we see it as a period of time from the first advent of Christ until his second advent. And in between there, it, that reference is often referred to as the church age. That is the period we believe that we are in. And Satan being bound, we interpreted that as Satan being restricted from preventing the gospel to go out to the nations and reach the Gentiles who were previously restricted from the benefits of the kingdom because Christ came first to the Jews and that's where the, the message was proclaimed and those were the persons who would have had access from the Old Testament period to God's promise and, and God's blessing, but they rejected the Messiah, they rejected the prophets that were sent. And so we saw that there was a change in God's purpose and God's plan for the gospel reaching the nations. And so the church became God's representative of his righteous standard to the gentle nations and Satan was not able to prevent that from happening. So the gospel has spread far and wide that was not confined to Judea, but it reached Jerusalem, sorry, not confined to Jerusalem, but it reached Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. The southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, and all the Gentile nations became exposed 
to the gospel of Christ. And Satan could not restrict that. He recognized that the word indicate that he's going to be loose for a season. And we were discussing the possibility as some Bible interpreters have sort of assessed that we don't know precisely when that period begins because the thousand year period is actually going to extend more than a thousand years because we do not believe it. It was, it was a literal thousand years. And as a matter of fact, since Christ came, we would have been living past a thousand years already. So it's a period that we do not know the full extent of it. And, and then we would have had issues in, in the adjustments to time and, and calendars. So we, we cannot even work out precisely any specific time that that period end and when Christ will return. But we know at the end of that period is when Christ will return. So that thousand year period is not a, a literal thousand years, but it's an extended period, which we call the church age. And then Satan will have a, a period of, of freedom again to impact the nations. And he would gather forces to perhaps make his conflict and his battle with the church even more intense because he will be aware now of the, the brevity of the time that he will have available to accomplish his purpose in trying to destroy the church. But as I indicated, Revelation already assures us, and that was what John was trying to get the churches in the first century to understand, that in spite of the conflict they were going through, because they were already in it, and John said that he was a brother in tribulation with those churches. They were all, all experiencing the attack of the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. And they were suffering as a result of it, torture and torment and all sorts of cruelty and even death in very, very large numbers by the Roman imperial system, which was fueled by the satanic power and by the religious or ecclesiastical Roman system, which came through the Roman Catholic Church, which also persecuted Christians, tortured many of them, burned them at the stake, and the Roman Catholic Inquisition was responsible for the life of, of hundreds of, of Christians who were martyred for their faith in, in Jesus Christ. So Satan was not only using the Roman imperial system, but he was using even the church, an apostate church, to oppose God's purpose for his pristine church that was established in the first century. So we look at some of the symbolism that was used and we talk about the resurrections and the deaths that mentioned in Revelation 20. And we indicated that there is a spiritual application to the concept of resurrection and a physical aspect to the concept of resurrection. The same thing applies to death. So we have a first resurrection and a second resurrection. We have a first death, which could be um, a spiritual death, meaning that we are dead in our trespasses and sins but it could also be physically because the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die. And it said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That death could also mean spiritual death, separation from God, because God wants to reach us, but sin separates us from God. So that is in essence how you can view death as well. But we are going to physically die. And once Christ does not return before we get to that stage in our lives, it is appointed unto us once to die. And that's a generalized statement because the reality is that there are some people who would physically die more than once because they were dead already and were resurrected by the power of God. Like Lazarus, for example, he is going to die physically a second time because he was resurrected from the grave. Eutychus who fell out from the window when Paul was preaching, Jairus' daughter. So we have examples of people who were resurrected and therefore they would die again but but the, so they will have more than one appointment with death but the the generalized position is that that's an appointment that people would experience once in their lives once we are not alive then when Christ returns but then there is another type of death which is separation from God in eternity and that's why the word explained in Revelation chapter 20, blessed and holy is he who have part in the first resurrection, which we believe is a 
spiritual resurrection, and we saw scriptures which supported that view, which we will not go back to. I'm just sort of giving a synopsis of what we have established from our study. And so we, we recognize, yes, there's a spiritual resurrection. We are saved from our sin, and we are blessed, we are holy, and, and we are secure from the second death, which is complete separation from God in eternity. For once you are saved, you will spend eternity in the presence of God. When we die, we go to a place called paradise because Jesus told the thief on the cross, the day you shall be with me in paradise. And he was experiencing physical death. But before he got to that point, he recognized Jesus as the Messiah. And so he received salvation. And Jesus said to him, today you shall be with me in paradise. So paradise is the place where the, the saints that have passed on from this world are reigning with Christ until they receive the the final destination, which is the usher in of the new Jerusalem and the eternal kingdom, that's where then we will go to our final um, abode, which is heaven. So when we die, and, and there are debates on that, but we will discuss more on that when we come into the final session, because we're going to be dealing with the whole concept of eternity and the final consummation of the kingdom of God and the end of all things and what that will entail. So we will... Um, dialogue a little more about that so the understanding first resurrection and second resurrection and we have recognized from the study of the scripture and a lot of references that we have used that the bible teaches one general resurrection so there is not going to be more than one bodily resurrection when christ returns to this earth so those who refer to the rapture as the first resurrection anticipating another resurrection to come after the tribulation and then another resurrection to come after the thousand year period which they claim would only be the resurrection for the unsaved that is not accurate according to other biblical references and remember we have to interpret the word in a holistic fashion and not identify just one particular reference and build a, a doctrine from that because there's enough evidence um in the Bible to support the, the fact that the intent of the word is to teach an end of all things when Christ returns to this world. So we look at scriptures which indicated that there'll be no space for a millennium and there will be no time for a millennium, literally. That is a precise thousand year reign when Christ returns to the earth because the scriptures indicate in um, first Corinthians where we saw Paul's teaching that Christ comes and there's a resurrection and he hands over the kingdom to the father and he brings an end to the final enemy which is death so we cannot go into a millennium which is a period where people will actually die where people will be living in mortal bodies because after the resurrection Paul indicated that the mortal puts on immortality and Jesus says that in, in the resurrection, there's no giving in marriage and there's no marriage. For those who have attained onto the resurrection, have a different type of body. So if we have attained onto the resurrection, which comes at the end of the world, then we cannot be having a, a millennial kingdom where mortal people are still going to be part of that kingdom and giving in marriage, reproducing, and also seeing death and also seeing rebellion and destruction because if there's going to be a final rebellion and Satan gathers all the hosts of the, of the evil ones to come against the people of God, it means that you are still dealing with rebellion in a world that is supposed to be a perfect world where Christ is ruling with a rod of iron. So how is it that Christ comes back to earth literally reigning with people and yet there's still rebellion? And we also saw a passage from Hebrews which says that when Christ returned the second time, he's not coming to deal with sin. He came the first time to deal with sin offering his life and he is not going to be doing that the second time when christ returns he's bringing an end to all things and there's going to be the final consummation i think we have a, a pretty clear understanding and that's the position of the of the church of god and while it might be not be the majority view because a lot of the evangelical churches including the nazarene the Wesleyan, the new testament the pentecost the baptist a whole lot of these in, in evangelical groups support that dispensational premillennialism, which will teach the rapture, which will teach 
the Antichrist, which will teach the, the um, Bible of Armageddon, which will teach the rapture, um, which will teach the millennium. That because that's the prevailing and that's the predominant view based on their interpretation. But I say we need not be unduly concerned about our position being in the minority because the minority can very often be very right. And if we have a sound um, basis for our interpretation, we're going with that. We are not saying that the other persons are heretics or that they are, are people who are attempting to deceive people from understanding the truth. It's just their interpretation of a lot of these scriptures because remember we said there's a lot of figurative language, symbolic language used. And, and if you attempt to, to have a, a literal interpretation, that's where you can come up with a, perhaps a, a different understanding from what the scriptures might have been intended. And that's where the variance comes between the premillennials and the amillennials because the post millennials share most of the views of the amillennials. So the, the, the main variance is between the, the pre millennials and, and the, the amillennials. So, so in a nutshell then, we, we saw that Revelation chapter 20 was identifying some important concepts that were meant to be um, interpreted figuratively with the devil being bound and in a bottle of a spit locked away by a key and being restricted from being able to influence people. But we said that in a figurative way, um, binding Satan does not even necessarily removing all evil from the world. That, that, that would not be perhaps what is the projection because we sin by word, thought and deed and the flesh, as the Bible indicates to us, is one of the major contributors to us going country to God's purpose. And then there is the world, which will be the systems of the world that go contrary to the things of God that influence people um, towards a path that takes them down a broad road that leads to sin and destruction. So the devil does not necessarily have to be actively engaged for people to sin. And we established that fact. And we saw scripture with reference um, to a statement Jesus made of entering into a person's life and binding the strong man that is there. And that is reference to the evil one. And that was not a literal binding. Now, I should make the point here that while we're trying to establish a distinction between literal and figurative or symbolic, we must be clear in mind that, that even when certain concepts are used symbolically or figuratively, there is still a literal application to them because our understanding of them is based on the, the actual thing itself, which means the literal form of it. For example, this is what I mean. When we say, uh, when Jesus said, I am the door, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Now, he is not a literal door. So that is a figurative or a metaphorical statement that Jesus is making. But the idea is that we have an understanding of the literal door. That's why we can understand the figurative language because we know what a door is and what the door represents. It can open and it can close. And Jesus says he is the entrance point, basically, to the kingdom. And we get into the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom of God, through Christ. So yes, he's, he's using figurative language or a metaphor when he says that I am the door. He is not a literal door, but he's still making this statement based on the fact that we understand what the literal door is. That we understand what the literal shepherd is. So I, I want to make that clear to you that there, is, there, are, there are still concepts that are, are real and actual even when figurative language is being used. The things that they are, are applying to or making the comparison with are, are real things. So I want us to, to, to keep that in mind that we don't get too confused with the whole literal and, and figurative application. And then there's always the, the concern as to when do you apply the literal, when do you apply the figurative? But I think very often the context 
makes that clear. And then as I indicated, there are other references in scripture which are, are not figurative or symbolic that give a clear picture. And very often that is what we use to help us understand even the figurative representation. So it does not make the Bible as difficult a book to understand as sometimes we, we make it. And there was one commentator who said that the problem with Revelation is not the book, but is in the, the, the problem is the interpreters of the book. Because um, an attempt to be too literal in the application of the, the concepts and the visions mentioned in Revelation, we can perhaps confuse and frustrate ourselves with really what the, the author intended because we are trained to be too literal and do not understand the figurative implication. So tonight we are dealing with another concept that follows a similar track, the Battle of Armageddon. So we are now in a position to decide whether or not we are dealing with figurative language or symbolic language when the reference is used. Whether we are dealing with a, a literal battle in a particular place, with bloodshed, with weapons of warfare. And so tonight, again, we have to look at this spiritual application used in the Bible, just that like we look at the first and the second resurrection, and we look at death in, in, the, in the spiritual way that references in the Bible have been used to explain and help us to understand what these terms represent. So it is with battle and war, there is a literal application to it, yes. And there's also a spiritual application to it. And so every time an indication is given or mentioned of war and battle and conflict, it might not necessarily mean bloodshed. It might not mean swords and spears. It might not mean a, a, a carnal sort of, of battle. And we will look at some of the scriptures, a few of them, which I know are already running through your head and you can perhaps quote some of them and perhaps even before I, I, I go into those I could ask on your own if you could give any references that could indicate um, a spiritual idea to fighting and to war which we are engaged in that does not necessarily um, imply that we are dealing with sores and spears or guns or missiles. So keep that thought in mind that when I, I give a little pause that you can, can interject with some of those references so that we can see how we balance off spiritual and, and literal and physical. And we see how the Bible really is a book that contains a lot of figurative language, which has clear meaning once we are able to understand the application of it. So like the thousand year reign in Revelation chapter 20, we are dealing with another concept which appears again just once in the Bible in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16 to be exact. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew town, Armageddon. And that's the only place that you're going to see that word mentioned. Just like Revelation 20 is the only place that you saw this thousand year reign actually spelled out. And therefore we have to see where we could get to understand that concept by looking at other parts of, of the scripture which will give us an understanding of what that could possibly mean. Now we have to, to figure this one out as well in terms of the intent of the, the author when that term was used. And bear in mind when I, when I say the, in, the intent of the author, remember that this word is coming from Christ to John. John is seeing a number of visions. We indicated that there were approximately 60 or slightly over. There were a number of visions. And the visions were not coming in a chronological sequence. So I indicated to you, when you see, and I saw, it does not mean it's a continuum. 
following or proceeding from the reference that was just before it. Sometimes we see a jump by maybe two or three chapters. We see things that project um, down further in Revelation, and then we see things that go back to early up in Revelation. And we, we, we call that a progressive parallelism where John sees different angles and different perspective of the same concept and he gives a little more detail or he ex or, or he goes back to mention the same concept that was mentioned further down. We have to read Revelation with that understanding. We have to read it with a, a very clear understanding that the bulk of it is symbolic language and that we have to interpret it in that particular light. And so the question before us tonight that we'll try to figure out is the language being used here in reference to Armageddon um, speaking to a literal battle that many of the theologians of the premillennial camp um, seem to believe. And it is such a prominent view that a, a, a lot of the movie makers and even in the realm of politics, there's reference often made to Armageddon. Um, and there was one president that was referred to the, the, the president of Armageddon because he was focusing on Armageddon to such a large degree. I think that was Ronald Reagan. And we've seen movies even carrying the same name. And just that the rapture gripped people in, in a literal way of people just disappearing from off the earth and planes coming and crashing and cars where Christians were, were um, taken from crashing and, and all sorts of chaos in the world because of the literal interpretation or understanding of, of that particular concept. In a similar way, people have grasped this whole Armageddon as a literal battle to be fought in Israel where all the armies and people are mentioned specific names and sometimes the names change according to how the new cycle goes and people's um, understanding of who be involved in this battle, like whether it be Russia and Iran and Iraq and Syria and Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And very often we form an assessment based on the nations that are in, 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 in current conflict with the children of Israel. And yes, there are um, Muslim nations which are constantly in conflict and there are um, other, other nations which would have had conflict with the Jews over the years. And we had the Germans had conflict with the Jews and people believe that the, the kings of the North are going to be the Russians and the kings of the East are going to be the Chinese, even though these specific countries are not mentioned, well, in, in any large measure in relation to the, the final conflicts, Yet that is the interpretation that, that people have. It's going to be a literal battle fought in the valley of Megiddo because there is no place called Armageddon. So you are not going to look into any geographical location and see a place um, called Armageddon. So when it says it gathers them, to a place called in the Hebrew town, Armageddon, that is the reference that we use in the Hebrew language to a place that was actually an actual place called Megiddo. That's M-E-G-I-D-D-O. And, and that is an actual place. Um, it's a reference to an ancient battleground near the Jezreel Valley. It is a little bit southwest of the Sea of Galilee, halfway between the Sea of Galilee and Caesarea, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It is, it is not actually a mountain, but a plain about 20 miles long and 15 miles wide. So it, it is not a, a massive place. So we would then have to imagine 200,000 of the Chinese army and plus the Russians and plus um, a lot of the Arab countries all from it and alike as, as initiated by the satanic horse to come against Israel in a literal way to destroy Jerusalem. So we have to see why the reference would have been made um, to this particular place. 
that's about Megiddo. Um, and Har, this is Har Megiddo, or Har Megedon, is, is the Hebrew reference to a hill, because Har means a hill or a mountain. But we said in actual fact, it's a large plain at the, the foothills of the mountain of Megiddo. And that was a place, I, rem I remember John is connecting a lot of his references to Old Testament. And we've seen that already, that there's a lot of application and connection to Old Testament occurrences in helping us to understand what John is saying or what Jesus is revealing to John in the, in the Revelation. So we must understand the, the historical perspective because Megiddo was a place where a lot of battles were fought. Some of them are recorded in the Bible, but a lot of them are, are not recorded in the Bible, but they, it is said that historically there were about 34 battles that were fought in, in that particular area of, of, of Palestine. So it was, it was a place of, of constant war. And I, I would want to give you some of the references that were made in the Old Testament and you will see the reason or the rationale behind using this particular term. So in, in the Bible, we have the Egyptians and the Canaanites involved, and that was in 1457 BC. That was one of the earliest um, fights recorded, and that was between the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And then the Old Testament records in um, 1285 BC, the Israelite prophetess Deborah and her military counterpart Barak defeated the Canaanite general Sisera at Mount Tabor, which is very close to Mount Megiddo. Then 40 years later, you had 300 Israelites under the prophet and commander Gideon. And you remember there were there were a large number of, of Midianites in, in their army and just 300 Israelites under Gideon and they won a, a great victory on a hill called Moray just to the east of Megiddo. That's in found in Judges 7, 17 to 22. And then in 1050 BC, Saul was engaged in a serious conflict with the Philistines. And that's where he himself and his sons were killed, where he committed suicide. And that was at Mount Gilbo, which was just a, a couple of miles southeast of Megiddo. So, so it's in the same area. And, and that is in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1 to 7. And then in 2 Kings chapter 9, we had Je Jehu, who fought against King Joram and he pierced his heart with an arrow in his chariot and that was also just around the area of Megiddo and then he remember would have killed Queen Jezebel that was his mother who was thrown from a window to her death in Jezreel and that's the same same area Jezreel Valley is basically the valley of Megiddo and that's the place where the Bible is making reference to, but it's called Armageddon in the Hebrew. Then in 609 BC, an Egyptian pharaoh defeated and killed King Joseph in a battle at Megiddo. That is 2 Kings 23, verses 29 and 30. So what we're seeing here is that there are a lot of battles. These are literal battles, physical battles that engage the people of God, the Israelites to a large degree, with foreign invaders or enemies to the children of Israel. And remember, in the Old Testament period, the children of Israel are the children of God. They, according to the Old Covenant, um, that was established, they had a purpose that was designed by God and they were to fulfill a certain purpose. And in that purpose, they would have obviously had to be engaged with forces that would want to have destroyed 
them as a nation and they were engaged in many physical battles. But we move in transition from physical Israel to spiritual Israel as the church, which are God's chosen people. And we are also, again, engaged in conflict. And we had physical battles with the Roman Empire. And as I indicated previously, physical battles with the apostate church. Yes, we have also been engaged with a spiritual warfare that Satan is raging against the church. Now, we can go back from the very beginning and realize that, that God's creation had always been in conflict with Satan because Satan's attempt is to destroy God's plan and purpose for mankind. And from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, he was waging war against God's purpose and God's plan for mankind. And Adam and Eve were deceived by the enemy and they, they lost that battle and mankind suffered as a result. But prior to that, we can go back into Revelation chapter 12. Remember, we, we, we said that Revelation 12 bore a, a significant um, comparative perspective to Revelation 20 because it, it, it introduced us to the the dragon, the devil himself, in direct opposition to the church. So just like the devil would have been using um, physical nations to try to destroy Israel as a, a, as a political entity, as a nation, as the people of God, Satan is also using a lot of um, political powers and religious powers and and all sorts of, of spiritual warfare to try to destroy the church. And Revelation 12 introduced us to that from the very beginning where Satan was trying to destroy the church at its inception. And Revelation reminded us er, further down that there was war in heaven, and that's where it started. So the first introduction to the concept of war and conflict started in heaven. No, you ask yourself a question. Was it a literal war? Was, was it, did it involve swords and spears and chariots and horses or, or even modern implements of, of missiles? What, what was the Satan gather an army to fight against the, uh, the angelic horse that were obedient to, to God's purpose and plan? No, it was not that type of war. It was, a, it was a rebellion or it was a war of worship. As I indicated before, it was all about who gets worship. So Satan attacking Adam and Eve in the garden is about who gets worship. So who would they give their obeisance? Are they going to listen to God and his word or are they going to listen to Satan and his directive? Is what Satan tried to do with Jesus. Is he going to listen to God, his father, and obey his word or he's going to listen to Satan and obey his word? So in heaven where it started, there was one third of the angels who listened to the devil, who a created being, rose up in pride as, des as described in, in, in Isaiah, and arrogance, and wanted the worship that was given to the Trinity. And, and so he was able to, to engage in, in rebellion and, and conflict and disobedience and inspired um, part of the angelic host to do that powerful being he was still is and, and and that is why we need God to be able to overcome him we cannot do it on our own we will be subject to his his power the Bible reminds us that we are no match for the enemy so revelation is introducing us to war and to conflict physically and spiritually and again as I said you're making the literal applications so you get an idea of where the, the, the writer is heading with the spiritual application. So that's why the concept of, of this war or these wars that were fought at Megiddo is introduced into the whole um, concept here because John is, is, is now showing us that in the same way God's people, literal Israel, 
and the spiritual Israeli church have always been in conflict because there is an opposing force seeking to destroy the kingdom of God, fueled by Satan. We are all engaged in that war and that conflict. And he was assuring the church that he was writing to then that we are going to be victorious in the conflict, but we must keep on the winning side and not get disconnected or distracted, but keep in the army of the Lord. In the same way there were physical battles, we are going to have spiritual battles. Now, as we look through Revelation 20 to get uh, uh, understanding of, of, the, of the full teaching and realization of what the whole passage was dealing with, we have to do that with 16. Now, if we just jump on one verse, we could find ourselves then going in a, in a, in a different direction than what was the, the intention of, of the author. So I'm going to pause here for a while to, to ask you to reflect on anything or your own thoughts on this battle, how you see it. And if you have any references before I give them to you, I, I would rather see if you have an understanding of the, the, the spiritual battle you can even think about some sounds that we have in our hymnals that address the issue. And yes, if we have reason to believe that Revelation might be relating to a spiritual um, concept of the final war, the final war or the final conflict that would have been raging all through the ages from the inception of the church. As a matter of fact, from the time mankind was on the earth, it says woe to those for the devil has come down, what the inhabitants of the earth. So, so war was being waged from the very beginning of civilization. And we are going to go through it right through the church age, right down to the to, to Christ's return. And we want to understand what John is trying to point us to when he's talking about this battle. So you give me your perspective on it from any research you might have done because we're going to dialogue, we're going to discuss and see if we can we can get from interpreting the, the, the scripture here in Revelation chapter 16 and some other passage that we will look at if we can, can um, conclude that the writer is not intending a literal battle because as we look at other references and referring to the kingdom, we will have to look at other references in relation to um, how the conflict of Christ coming back to fight will actually apply to his teaching about his kingdom and teaching about his purpose. And if that will fit into the, the overall narrative and understanding of what Christ is about, will he literally come back and fight and engage in a battle where people will be killed and blood will be shed in the light of the fact that he told Peter not to engage in that sort of, of, of conflict when they came to arrest him because his kingdom is not of that nature. How, how do we mar, um, marry these, these ideas and concepts when we try to figure out what this final battle is about? So I pause. So any comments? Um, if you have come up with any scripture references, in relation to battle being represented in a spiritual way and not in a literal way. And if you have any idea about Armageddon and how you see it and what you think of it and what you think is referring to and what you think is John intention for us to understand, you can also give me your opinion. So I pause at this time. Or any questions you might have in your mind in relation to the whole concept of, of warfare and battle. And even the literal application of it, if we think that that is going to be an end time war that will actually come upon the world. Good night, good night, sir. Yes, Brother Randy. How are you? I am doing well, and how are you? I good, I good. You know, so I'm not you know, like opening the batting, but yeah, yeah, but, but very, very often it's good to open the batting. I set the <laughs> stage. All right, no. What what what's the score gonna bat there? 
from the scripture that you and I, I, or I see the conflict that we are fighting is between good and evil. Okay. Because I find it very difficult that Jesus would say to Peter, Peter, put up your sword. Uh -huh. If you put up your sword, you will die by the sword. And then afterwards, no, he is coming back to be involved in this bloody battle. I, 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 I cannot see that happening. Okay. And then, and then to, to illustrate what Christ was saying, he took up the gentleman ears that Peter cut off and he put it yes. back on. Then That's another right. reference, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my saints fight? Because you know, when one right. king before another jurisdiction, they would fight to conquer. Yes. And Christ said no. So I, I think when the writer of Revelation is referring to the battle, he's referring to this, the, the church has always had to fight a battle between good and evil. And I think mm -hmm. that battle that we are involved in when we are talking about this battle. Then to add some more references when you made reference to this Valley Megiddo, um, mm -hmm. Judges, Judges 5, 19, then it's then Amaziah, then 2 Kings 9, 27, when it mm -hmm. says Amaziah died, all of this happened in that same valley. Then Josiah valley. was killed by Pharaoh. And yes. in 2 Kings 23, 29, Josiah was killed by Pharaoh in this same valley. So as mm -hmm. you say, you would really say a number of, in this place, a number of wars but have already taken place between God's people and the enemy. Right. And and they and that is where they fought. But then as you as you rightfully say, I, I and I've been thinking that we, the Christians, will always be involved to, in a battle of what is good and evil and to, and defending the truth, defending what is true. Now, one of the big battles that we are fighting with today is this thing of homosexuality mm -hmm. and the LGBT or what we call it, you see? And the, the world is saying one thing, and then we have to apply what the word of God is saying. Isn't that, do we see that as a battle? It is. It is, it, it is a battle. And therefore, we have to be able to say, well, this is what the word of God is saying. And then because we take a stand on the word, we will come in conflict now with the world system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. We, we, we come in conflict with, with, with what the beast represents and what his mark and what his, his image is all about. All right. Thank you very much, Randy, for that contribution. So you are basically seeing a spiritual application to the, the battle mentioned here. All right. All right, still some space for some more. We hear Randy very often. I want to hear some other voices. I remember you have to unmute your mic or, or sometimes indicate by your raised hand so that you want to speak because I think sometimes that might be a little issue and that's why we don't hear some people getting in. Reverend Jetman, I see here um, Ms. Sandra Pollard Boskett. Bostick, she made reference to Ephesians 6, 10 to 17 and suggests that yes. that enforces that the battle is spiritual. All right. That's very good. That's one of the passages they had here. That's very correct. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, we wrestle not, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers against spiritual wickedness all right so yes that's one verse which indicates that the battle is spiritual and that is speaking about conflict that the church is engaging thank you sandra that's very good Rebecca Jackman. 
Yes. Yes, I just came back because I want to, if you can take a note of this, because um, I don't know if you have ever checked something called the World Parliament of Religion at Chicago in 1893. Where World, the World Parliament of Religion? No, I have not, I've, I've not checked that. Yeah, but because but that that would do that will show you to a lot of the things that you're even talking about when these then when that was established and people from the different diverse religions came together mm -hmm. and then when they came together they they set to 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 go opposed to Christianity, you know. Yeah. So so if if you get anything you get a chance you can check it the words problem of religion at Chicago. In eighteen, in eighteen ninety three. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, some of you might be thinking to join another verse, to, to the one that Sandra would have given, which is a very good verse and a very appropriate one. Our Second Corinthians chapter ten. You can make a note of that. Second Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3. It says, For we, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's another spiritual application from the word. And we're not dealing with figurative language here. Now we're dealing with precise um, language telling us that the, the warfare is not a carnal warfare. And Ephesians was telling us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it is not a, a battle which involves the lives of, of people directly, but is against um, spiritual um, wickedness. And it's, it's the darkness, it's the forces of evil in this world that are engaging Christians. All right, I pause again to give space to anybody else who wants to make a comment. If you see any other references that would indicate the fact that we can apply a spiritual application to the concept of warfare. And, and that is perhaps the intent that we might have in the book of Revelation. All right, while you were thinking again, Second Timothy chapter two, Verse 3 to 5. And please don't be afraid to talk to me. And you need some questions if you have that um, you're having any difficulty or things that you have heard people raise or rebuttals to our position, things that those introduce because, you know, it, it will stimulate some thought and, and it will engage me in areas perhaps that I may not have, have covered or might have seen. And, and, and then we can get more information and go into things into more depth. So I want that as well questions that you have or things you need to clarify. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3 to 5. Thou therefore, Paul speaking to Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. So we're we we introducing war concepts here, soldiers and, and fighting. But Paul is indicating here that he's dealing with a, a spiritual battle, conflict. So yes, in a sense, that's a fight, but it is not a, a flesh and blood fighting that is involving specific people. So we, we have established, yes, God has been engaged in physical battles on behalf of his people. And if it had not been for God, the children of Israel many times would have been crushed by their enemies. 
when they lived according to God's God's plans and and God's purpose, that's why I indicated you last week that that God's covenant relationship with the Jews was was based on their response to God's commands, God's laws, God's ordinances, God's dictates. So it was conditional. And we saw it even in their battles. When they were living in accordance with God's purpose, when their kings were righteous and obeying God's laws and resisting paganism, and idolatrous practice and sin, they were victorious. When they refused to do what God wanted them to do, they got destroyed. So while God was defending the children of Israel, we saw again in, 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 a, in a practical way that it was conditional. And so God is not obligated to do anything um, that he would have promised the children of Israel, even defending them, if they refused to obey what God indicated. We saw it even when they went and took back the ark from the Philistines. And they brought back the ark. And they were singing and dancing and rejoicing, but, but they were singing in the, in, in the camp and they, were, and they were not functioning according to God, uh, the way that God wanted them to, 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 to function. And the Philistines came and, 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 and destroyed thousands of them. And then you saw how God delivered them from the jets that were across um, the Jordan River. And we were talking about literal jets here. No, it's not a figurative word. They were they were jets in in Canaan. There were people who were very large, and that's why um, the report came back that they looked like grasshoppers in the people's eyes. Folks, that was not a, a figurative statement. That was really what it was like. They were huge people in the land of Canaan, and that's why they were afraid um, to cross Jordan to go over. But they eventually did, and God fought for them. And God brought them the walls of Jericho, which were walls that they could not have um, brought down on their own. But after leaving Jericho, they then were defeated by a little city called Ai, because God told them not to take certain things when they captured Jericho, and Achan and his family disobeyed God. And judgment came on the whole of the of, of, of the of the, the, the Israelite people because of the disobedience of, 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 of a few. Shown as force, as I have indicated, that a lot of the premillennial um, positions are that God is obligated to keep certain promises and do certain things on behalf of the Jews, regardless of how they function or how they operate. No, he isn't. And we see a lot of the conditional responses when they did well, they got God's blessing and prosperity. And when they did wrong, they got God's judgment and, they, and, they, and, and God turned his back on them and allowed his enemies, their enemies to defeat them. So, 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 so Jesus is, is through John showing us that God stands for his people and God would defend his people in the same way he defended the children of Israel in many of those battles. And we are drawing reference to a lot of them that were fought at Megiddo because that was one of the common places of, of conflict. But it was not the only place. And it's not the only battle that the children of Israel would have been engaged in. They would have been engaged in, engaged in several battles. And God fought for them. And, and God rescued them. And God defended them. And, and, and the reference is being drawn now for the church to understand that in the same way God defended literal Israel, his people, chosen people he is going to defend the church and stand by the church um spiritual israel we are of the seed of abraham by faith the church includes jew and gentiles yes predominantly gentiles because the jews resisted their messiah and even up to now they are resisting the messiah and as i said people's expectation is that god will come back to earth and give them another elongated period to get saved having lived in rebellion and, and, um, and, and transgression of, of God's rule and authority in their own lives so I would have a problem with that now as I indicated we are going to look at Revelation 16 and go through it in a little more detail to build up a picture of what John is trying to show and, and the, the concept of the 
of where um, that reference to Armageddon comes in. I'm going to read from the beginning, verse 1, Revelation chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple. And I'm, I'm reading this because this is where the, the concept of Armageddon comes. There's nowhere else in Revelation. And there's nowhere else in the, in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. I mentioned it's referring to a particular place, drawing reference to a place that has drawn a, a sort of a parallel name. But it is not, as I said, a place mentioned in, in the Bible called Armageddon. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of, of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sword upon men, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which had worshipped his image. Now watch that. So we are seeing Revelation 16 start out by speaking about judgment. And judgment is coming on people who had the mark of the beast and upon them which had worshipped his image. So we are talking here about judgment coming to the people who have opposed and who have transgressed God's purpose and plan for, for, for mankind. And rather than worshipping um, God and having his seal, there are persons who took the mark. So we are looking at judgment. And, um, and I'm saying that chapter 16 is dealing in large measure with judgment that is coming upon the world to those persons who disobey God all across the world. And it's not referring just to a specific group of people, but it's all people, all nations, all tribes, where people have refused to submit themselves to the authority of God, but allow the world system and its lifestyles and, and, and its worldviews and, and, and belief systems and practices to control their lives. Revelation is saying judgment is going to come. God will judge and vindicate all those who oppose him and all those who oppose and oppress his people. And remember we saw back in Revelation chapter 6, that the souls of the persons who were martyred were crying out and asking God, how long will it take you before you, you take vengeance on all of these people who have opposed Christianity? And remember, John is writing to people who are undergoing this as a reality in their lives. And, and they could have been tempted to give up believing that well, how are we going to overcome the powerful Roman armies and the powerful Roman Empire, how are we going to come overcome all this opposition that um, we are fighting against? And we are seeing thousands of Christians being killed, martyred, and they would have been inclination for them to lose hope and to give up. And what John is showing all through the book is that judgment will come. And yes, God will avenge all those who have opposed, oppressed, and killed Christians, because when you are doing that to God's people, you are doing it against God. And Jesus said that, you remember in Matthew, as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And, and John wants the Christians, the first century Christians to understand, don't give up. Keep fighting. Hold on. Because vindication is going to come. Victory is going to come. And God is going to avenge you. We are going to win this war. So do not lose hope. Take courage. This is the overall message. And so we are seeing Revelation 16 open with, with judgment here and uh, it's shown the authority of God so despite whatever um, political leaders feel despite whatever systems um, think the power they have God is sovereign and he will bring judgment and nobody can stay the hand of God and this is what is being indicated here the second angel poured out verse 3 is right upon the sea so you had judgment on the earth you had judgment on the sea, and we're going to explain um, the connection here. And it became as blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now, watch again, that, that reference is going to be made to Old Testament. Because remember, we have in the past that all the nations that opposed and afflicted God's people, I think we mentioned that already, like Egypt, 
and like Babylon and Assyria, all of those got judged by God. They oppressed God's people, but judgment eventually came to all of them. And John is here going back and looking back at what happened to Egypt. And some of the reference here that you're going to see is going to make a comparison to, to the, some of the plagues that um, took place in Egypt. So the analogy is showing conflict, war against God's people and God's, God vindicating um, his, his people. So back in Revelation 6, the answer came back, well, not yet. Have patience because there are more that have to go through what you have already gone through. God's plan is not completed yet. More Christians are going to suffer. More Christians are going to have to, 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 um, to go through the, the war that you're experiencing. And so, yes, they will be avenged, but not yet. Have patience. That was the word given in Revelation chapter 6 to those who were martyred and uh, who were alive in this embodied spirit and, and, and in contact and in communion with, with Christ. The second angel, and it came as blood. Water turned into blood in Egypt. Remember that. And the third angel poured out his veil upon the rivers and the, and the, and the fountains of waters, and they became as blood. I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and which was and shall be. And because thou hast judged thus, for they have shed the blood of the saints. You see the reason why? They have shed the, the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard, remember, they are worthy of the judgment. They, they are being judged because of what they have done. And, and the important thing that we have to gather from what Revelation is showing is that, yes, the world system will function and operate as they like. And people will take the mark and follow the mark and obey the image and reject God. But judgment is going to come. And this is a lesson that we have to understand and preach to people. The reality is that God will judge the world. This wrath here is not what Christians will have to face because this is speaking of Judgment that will come for disobedience and rebellion against God, people who took the mark. Jesus Christ bore this wrath and this judgment that will come on the world as a punishment for sin and rebellion. We will escape that because we have received Christ. Christ took that for us. That, that's, that's what Christ has done for us. He bore the wrath of God. And what John is showing here. Um, in, in this chapter is that judgment is, in, is pending for those people who continue to, to live um, in contrary to God. I heard another angel um, out of the altar say, verse 7, Even so, Lord Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured his vial upon the sun, and the, and the power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now, now watch the judgment come in. The judgment came on the earth. The judgment came on the sea. And judgment is coming now on the heavenly bodies. And, 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 and what this is indicating is that all the things that God, that man depends on, he is going to find, is going to be a serious problem. He's going to depend on the earth for food. And so famine and, and all those things will come as a result of the judgment. He's going to depend on the sea when he can't get it from the land. And, and the blood um, is in the sea, destroying the life in the sea. So no food on the land, no food on, in, in the sea. And then it is, is affecting also now the, the heavenly bodies. So it is, it's total judgment that, that we will not escape. This is what is indicating. And it's showing the sovereign authority of God because God has power over all these things, over the earth, over the sea, and over the heavenly bodies. And men were, were scorched with great heat. We hear a lot now about global warming and the, and the, and the, and, and the attempt to, to prevent the warming. So, so could we see yes unfolding in our world as judgment for, for sin, as God judge the nations that oppose his people? Yes, God is going to bring judgment to a world as a, an oppressing Christianity and going contrary um, to God's plan. Yes, Reverend Jackman. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. No. That's all right. 
connect a question in connection with what you're reading. Yes. Is, is it possible that some of the things that we are seeing happening in the world right now is connected to what you're just reading when you talk about the judgment of God? Very possible. Very possible. And that's why he said that there are there are some theologians that believe that Satan has been loosed for the season. Now, we, we don't have specific kind of references. And as I say, we don't know when that season begins and when it ends. But we know that we are in the gospel age where God is giving grace for people to be saved, for people not to, to take the mark and for people to obey him. And God is going to judge because what, what John is saying, that as God judged nations in battle physically against Israel and against the church, so he's going to bring judgment again on this world because forces are going to join um, themselves, influenced by Satan, against the church. And this is where the judgment of God perhaps is going to unfold in large measure. And we have already seen that beginning to happen of, of, of the buildup of antagonism against Christianity and against the church. And yes, we have seen, as I told you, that hyperbole is a way that the prophets express themselves and we can see hyperbole in Revelation. But it is not always that the language might necessarily be hyperbole. It could actually be literal interpreted as something that could happen to that extent and that capacity and I gave you examples um, last week remember we had the um, the Spanish flu that killed millions of people we are alarming about COVID now and about 5 million people dead but if you go back to the early 14th century when you had the Black Death which spread all across Europe and Asia the, the death toll was about 200 million people from 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 the from the Black Death, a pandemic that ripped across all through Europe and and um and parts of, of of Asia, and the population of the world at that time was only about five hundred million. So if if two hundred million people die, you could understand that almost half the population of the world, and that was something that literally happened. And I mentioned a flood in China that killed about 3.1 or 3.4 um, million people in one country. So, so, so I indicated, yes, I believe that judgment is going to come on this world because God is going to vindicate the, the adversarial um, practices that we are, we are going to have in this world against God's people. God has always brought judgment on people who have opposed um, his people, whether the, the, the literal Jews or the spiritual Jews, meaning the church. And, and yes, some of these things that we're seeing here could actually be practically experienced and we might begin to see them. We, we are seeing forest fires all over the place and they said that's a result of global warming and millions of acres of land is being scorched. Think about it. We are, we are now in a pandemic and the scientists are saying that you could experience these pandemics every, every five years. And while we are dealing with this now, next five years, we could be facing another pandemic. And there have been some pandemics, they said, are worse than this one. So while we are alarmed about the death toll, we need to be reminded, and I think sometimes people don't go back in history and, and show people these things, that the, 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 the wrath and the judgment that has been coming on this world has been very, very, very real. And, and as I said, what God does not hinder, he allows. And, and while these things might come as a result of, of man's rebellion against God and God's standards, as a matter of fact, when they had that black plague, people believed that it was coming to the end of the world and that God was literally um, bringing judgment on, on the earth. And there were people who formed a sort of cult group that were trying to appease the wrath of God and were virtually mutilating themselves. But, but you, you, can't, you can't change God's judgment by... by by, by, um, by, by doing that. So yes, Randy, I believe that, that what John is saying here, and if you, you go on into chapter 19, you will see judgment. So judgment is going to come on the world. It is going to come on the systems. And eventually, when you go right to the end of the chapter, you see that judgment comes on the false prophet, the beast, and the dragon. All the opposing forces 
that the church has had to be dealing with are going to be judged. And the people who align themselves with that system are going to be judged. Yes, we are going to be in the world where we will be affected by these things. But the reality is that when we are absent from this body, we are present with the Lord. And death is just a transition for us. But, but death for people who are not aligned with God is, is a serious issue. Yes, yeah, so Randy, I, I would be inclined to agree that some of these things could be already um, be a foreshadow because when we begin to see these things, it's, it's just the beginning of sorrows. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out the vial upon the Sorry. seal of the beast. Yes. Before you continue, I believe uh, Ian has a query or comment. Okay. Yes, brother. Hi, good evening, um, <clears throat> Reverend Jackman. Yes. Earlier you mentioned um, that we in the Church of God yes. would be in the minority. And you listed quite a long list of the mainstream churches. Yes. Um, predominantly in our Barbadian society. And I'm thinking about the many folk who um, would have come along over the yes. years and been taught about the rapture. I know they're strong-rooted Christians who look forward to these events, and this is yes. what they have been taught for, for their entire lives. Yes. Um, how do we, as the Church of God, and... Um, based on what we have been taught in this series um, by you and how do we communicate because this is what I'm thinking about um, because these are all our brothers and sisters in the Lord um, mm -hmm. has there been any thought given to churches coming together to discuss these things because when you look at the history of our church all the way back to Jerusalem when there was much contention about the Gentiles and what they were supposed to do in terms of their becoming part of the family of God. I think this started all the way back then because you would agree with me that there has never been another piece of literature that has had so much interpretation as the Bible. And, yeah. and all I know, all I know, Reverend Jackman, people are still reading the word of God and interpreting it as you know different ways and so on and so forth so yes as you as you've always said this has this has been uh uh history has shown that the bible is is a is a is a piece of literature that we all read and see and interpret it in different ways so i'm asking how do we bridge this gap if there is a possibility and how do how do we go about doing that because you're talking about a lot of people um a lot of fellow christians who are you know, really wholeheartedly serving the Lord, but they're being taught um, this other way. That's my question. All right. Now, remember I indicated that our, our salvation and our relationship with God does not necessarily depend on our interpretation um, of these particular scriptures and our, our understanding of them. You can still be saved and not fully understand um, Armageddon, um, understand the millennium and those concepts. And you could have a view which might go contrary to what we believe the Bible is actually teaching and you can still be saved. The, the danger with some of the theologies connected um, to this perspective is that people who are living at the point in time connected to Christ's coming could be misled and deceived and lose their salvation if they accept this particular doctrine. Because if, if, there is no rapture and that Christ comes and brings an end to all things. The people who are believing that a rapture will occur and give them a chance then afterwards to be saved because technically that's what will happen. Because when you see the rapture occur and, and you've got seven years tribulation before Christ comes back to the earth, which means you'll be able to calculate the exact time which no man knows and never should have been able to know according to scripture. That's why I would have problems with that issue. Then you, you could have a second chance. And what they're teaching on the millennium is actually saying is that when all the Jews reject Christ, they will have another chance in the millennium to be saved. And that is not the overall teaching of the Bible. You've got to receive Christ now in the gospel age because the time will come when Christ returns. There is no more offer of salvation. 
And we, we saw that in Hebrews, that when Christ returns, there's, he is not dealing with sin and salvation. He is bringing an end to all things. Now, all we can do is to share our particular position. As I said, it's in the my, my minority because that theology was established in a lot of Bible seminaries, which were controlled by people who had that particular perspective. Pastors came up trained with that theology and it was established. But that was not the first century theology. A lot of the theology that we, we have now that is accepted by the majority of the evangelical churches came around the 1800s. But prior to that, the, 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 the amillennial perspective in relation to Christ coming once, one general judgment, no millennial kingdom, was basically the position. Augustine, one of the, the important um, uh, fathers of the early church, he wants to believe in the millennium, but his study of the scriptures, he said he changed his position on a literal millennium and believed that it was figurative. Now, because people are about defending their doctrine rather than defending their word, the word of God, that's why he said it's important that we defend the word of God because that's what the Bible tells us contained for the faith that was given to us people are defending their doctrine positions and just did, and they're, it's going to be difficult to get them to adjust to, to looking and examining their position based on the scripture and I, I know it's going to be hard to get that to do and God is going to come back and people is still, are still going to be holding their particular views then to realize that they could possibly be wrong now could we be wrong? I, I, I feel strongly that a lot of our interpretations are based on the word and much of them um, are right. Now, if you go back to the first century church, the confusion that we have in now with the word and interpretation of the Bible didn't exist then. The Bible said they gave themselves to the apostles' doctrine and teaching. And the apostles taught only what they were taught by Jesus. And they had a clear and a proper understanding of what they were to pass on. And all the members in the early church followed that particular doctrine. It's when the gospel began to spread and extend to gentle countries that had pagan backgrounds and pagan influences that those ideas start to creep into the church. And then you had to you started getting doctrinal issues. Paul said that wolves would enter, uh, causing a thought a, a, a lot of people to fall away. John said. And in First John, that we already have signs of people preaching false doctrines, and and they have even come out from among us and now gone out teaching um, false 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 heresy. But the the the, the first century church um, in in the early stages had no problem with interpreting what the Bible doctrine was. But we have over the years been influenced strongly by people opinion. And as I said, um, pagan ideas and ideologies that have crept into the church have caused a whole lot of confusion. And because of very powerful people, as I said, the Schofield reference Bible was very major in getting people to accept that particular theological position because he was preventing this and his, his um, study Bible was predominantly what was used in seminaries and what was taught to the majority of the established um, evangelical groups and that's why it's prevalent now. So all we can do as a, as a church is to proclaim what we believe and that's what I was trying to do to show you um, why we believe what we believe and why it has a sound biblical basis which I believe we can stand on because a lot of our Christians are exposed to TDN to a lot of the theology of, of the other side and will need to know what they believe and why they believe it, that they can have a justifiable position for holding on to that. But yes, as you rightfully said, Ian, there are Christians, they are, they are, as I said, they are blood wash believers, but because of a lot of the symbolic language that has been used in the Bible, which was um, interpreted too literally, they came up with a different perspective and a different idea, which is just a matter of interpretation. But generally speaking, both, but well, well, all three, the pre-millennialists, the post-millennialists, and the amillennialists, all of us believe that Christ will come again. It's just the timing and what will happen afterwards. All of us believe in a judgment. All of us believe in eternity. 
So there are, there are common things which are the fundamental things that all of us believe. We believe in salvation through Christ and that there's no other name which, whereby we must be saved. So, so we believe in the fundamentals, but the differences come in the end time events and how they are going to occur. So they can't be major in relation to your salvation, but, but they could be important where people could be misled into believing that they have time after the return of Christ to be saved. And that is where it could become um, a, a serious issue because the Bible does not give us that indication. All right, in answer yeah. to, to the, your question. And that is why Reverend Jack made the scripture it say that we must study to show ourselves approved to God. Yes. Rightly dividing the word because you can wrongfully divide the word. And if you wrongfully divide the word, that means that you are misleading people. If, if you study, you're able with the Holy Spirit to help people to have a deeper understanding of it. But then if we, if it, if it's put out there incorrect, then you will see, you'll be seen as misleading people. But I, I, there's yes, a question you yes. asked concerning the rapture, because you made reference to that. With, no, if, if the church is raptured, right. the, can we assume that the church is raptured? The Holy Spirit is gone too, right? I, I, can we say that? That's what they say. That, 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 the, that, that oh. the, rapture, the rapture removes the Holy Spirit from the earth. And that's why all of these tragedies will unfold because we no longer have the spirit of God on the Holy Spirit of the earth. And, and, and I will ask the question, if that is the case, how are people going to get saved? Because well, wait, wait, Bible says, right, the Bible says no man can come to God, to Christ, unless the spirit draws in. But some will argue that the Holy Spirit does not have to be dwelling with us on earth to draw people. He can be drawing them from in heaven. But then, but, have you ever uh, heard anybody reference to these these two witnesses, because they made reference to these two witnesses that will come yes. during that period, to these two witnesses that will come during that, during that period. And also... Right. And again, and, yeah, and again, watch the language. Watch the language and watch the references. You see, we have to understand that John, but don't, don't say John, because Jesus is giving the revelation and he's the author of the word. So he knows all the applications. And he knows all the reference that he's drawing and what he intends. Now, those two witnesses are connected again in the Old Testament. One, who has the power to turn the water into blood. And two, one who has the power to call on fire from heaven. Who are these? We would assume then that it referring to Moses and Elijah. So what they believe is that Moses will literally come back and Elijah will literally come back and witness to the Jews for their salvation. And watch it. These two witnesses are killed. Now, come on. If Moses and Elijah coming back into our world, they are coming back as resurrected people, saints. So they can't, they can't die. They are immortal. So it cannot be literal. I think it's referring to the word and the Holy Spirit that basically the, the world is going to oppress and suppress. And that is what is happening. We are trying to suppress the word and to suppress the, 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 the spirit, which are the witnesses to uh, um, through the gospel to, to bring salvation to mankind and because people are opposing and rejecting these two witnesses is why they're taking the mark of the beast and who kills them it's the same people that have that are, are taking that, that image so yes the world is going to strongly oppose and it's getting worse and worse and it's going to increase intensity against the church and John is reminding us, looking back at past conflict and projecting in the future, and, and God is going to bring judgment, as he has always done in the past, on people and nations that reject God's um, sovereign purpose and oppress and oppose and murder and martyr his people. So, so yes, we have to understand concepts in the whole perspective, and that's what I like to do. You can jump on a verse or two and say, aha, that's what that means. But no, when you look at the Bible as a whole, because remember, there's a whole narrative, there's a whole picture which you must come to understand. And if we don't do that, we could pick up little pieces and miss the whole picture. So we jump on this battle of Armageddon and the concept of, 
of Satan and the Antichrist joining the forces of the of the Gentile world against the Jews to go to the, the to, um, to the battle, the valley of Megiddo to fight. And as Brother John indicated last week, what are they fighting with? When there was war in heaven, what were they fighting with? And you are going to bring people back. And, and, and as one primalenist I heard saying, that the Christians are going to be fighting alongside with Jesus. And they misinterpret a verse in, in the Bible, which I will show you, that they are saying that we are going to be involved in this battle too. So we're coming back down here to fight. So if you think that you ended it all with what happened um, by the resurrection, no, we're we coming back down here to fight. Now, you see, we didn't, we, we didn't get to the end of chapter 16. And there's some very important verses to come here which we will have to pick up on in the next session because we can't uh, conclude because we already go over our time. So we will hold the rest of chapter 16 to get the full picture, but you can see it's talking about judgment and judgment against those who have opposed God's people. And you will see how people respond to the judgment. And I think what John is pointing is to the final conflict. It is going to reach a climax. And, and really, God is going to have to come again to the defense of his people because of the opposition that we are going to face in this world. And, and John is heading in that direction. And verse 16, even though it's high up in the Bible, is referring to really end time. I mean, coming towards the end of the world, not just the end of the age. So we will pause there for tonight and pick up on more details in relation to the battle and conflict at Armageddon and what it could mean and what it would represent and analyze it in the perspective of if it's literal, how could it um, connect with what the word of God is showing and who would be involved and how it would be really waged if it's to be a literal battle. So I pause here for tonight. If there's one question that anybody wants to get in, um, I could give you an answer, but apart from that, if there are no questions, I will turn you back over um, to Jeff. So there's still some more excitement to come, and, and we will finish that off and, and go on to look then at eternity, because that should not take us um, two sessions, because I think the concepts that we will discuss there could be quickly uh, understood and analyzed. Thank you very much.